I'm going to be presenting on, multi, on the multi-benefit line repurposing program, and this is a, um, a, a abbreviated version of the presentation that Ann Hayden and, and I, I presented on uh, back in uh, May, early May. And, and I, I uh, reason we're going abbreviated because um, uh, as a lot of the folks are on on this call who were also part of our kickoff and part of some, some of these earlier presentations can can attest. We we can probably talk about this for, for a lot more than an hour. But uh, uh, Tammy is going to be presenting on the emergency services uh, uh, department's efforts for uh, self help enterprises and its relation to possible relation uh, to uh, a flood mark. So I just wanted to provide that uh, uh, background. Uh, let, let's get started with uh, the overview of the multi-benefit land repurposing uh, program. And again, this is a, a presentation that Anne and, and I did uh, back in, in early May. So this is the, the outline that, that we're going to be presenting. We're going to uh, uh, cover uh, you know, California drought, uh, groundwater sustainability, land use, uh, risk of unmanaged land, uh, and the, the opportunities for, for this program uh, through the MLRP. Uh, our role as a state support entity, uh, EDF, uh, Rodman Defense Fund, and um, uh, self help enterprises are the co chairs and our priorities moving forward. And then hopefully we'll have some time to answer uh, and, and respond to questions. And I invite folks on this call, uh, and uh, Anna and also uh, Kylie, I believe we're also on this call. Feel free to jump in at, at that point if you have any comments, questions, or concerns. Um, so, as we all know, we're, we're in a, this prolonged drought uh, that uh, we've been a part of probably, you know, at least. 10 years and, and many, and many, uh, depending on who you ask, but uh, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act uh, uh, has mandated that by 2040, 2042, we uh, have to uh, gain sustainability here, here in, in, in California. And uh, that means that um, um, to, you know, counter the effects of, of a lot of, uh, of this overdraft that we've been having over these many, many years. and. Uh, uh, we're in the process of doing that. As a result of that, we we have to make some pretty hard choices, and uh, one of those hard choices is going to be uh, land retirement, land fouling, or land repurposing, or, or or finding other opportunities for for for, for land in the valley. As um, the impact of of, of this uh, effort of reducing uh, the the use of irrigated lands is likely going to result between twenty and 20, uh, fifteen and twenty percent reduction in irrigated farmlands of, of the valley by twenty forty. Uh, I don't know if folks are able to see uh, uh, much of the view, but uh, this is a um, illustrative, illustrative example that EDF put together on what some of that impact may look across our San Joaquin Valley. And as you can see, um, this is what an uncoordinated approach would look like. Next slide. And, you know, along with that, we, we would be looking at other challenges. You know, folks are concerned about dust, folks are concerned about uh, you know, um, you know, impacts to the local economy, um, you know, um, land becoming over, overly arid, um, not utilizing existing land. And we're looking to identify opportunities to uh, connect a diverse set of stakeholders uh, in this process, in this initial process to make sure that that group is um, uh, providing uh, that, their expertise and helping us develop a path forward. So what are, what are these opportunities and these these, these alternative plans from, uh, in the multi-benefit land repurposing? Well, here here they are uh, going from irrigated crops uh, and and some of these areas that are supposed to be uh, repurposed to grazing solar dryland crops and these are not all, uh, inclusive of all the upper possible opportunities, which is why we're involved in those separate parks recharge habitat restoration and amongst amongst other opportunities. What would planning versus not planning, the coordination, what would it look like? And, and uh, this is a, a comparison that uh, was provided um, by, our, by, our, by our partners at EDF that shows, uh, you know, what potentially uh, some of these outcomes might, might, might look like if we, uh, you know, plan versus not plan. And this is an extension of, of a lot of the work that EDF and uh, uh, Vicky uh, Ortiz uh, 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 Dr. Uh, excuse me, Vicky Espinosa, uh, uh, Dr. Vicky Espinosa, uh, uh, who um, was doing a lot of um, uh, coordination with EDF early on uh, to uh, advance this effort, um, and um, early on, uh, and this is a, a strategic line repurposing coordination uh, input and guide that, that they provided, uh, which is um, should be available um, um, through online. Um, as you know, this is an effort that's 
drawing a lot of excitement. A lot of folks are really excited about this process, and we and and as our EDF and, and self help, and uh, we rarely get this type of uh, collaboration. And this is just to illustrate uh, the, the level uh, of collaboration that uh, folks are, uh, you know, at least interest at the interest level are involved in and uh, are, are wanting to uh, participate in this and very exciting uh, opportunity of, of, of moving towards sustainability by looking at alternative uses to some of the land that's proposed to be uh, a retired fallow or you know, opportunity to start for. So what are the goals? Well, top of the line, uh, top of the list is, is groundwater sustainability. Uh, you know, we're looking to move land from more intensive water use to less intensive water use. Um, and we're also looking to, uh, uh, you know, look for opportunities where, you know, maintaining natural resources uh, uh, might, might be an option, um, providing short to medium term long drop, drop relief where, 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 where recharge opportunities are, 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 are an option and sustaining um, uh, the local land-based economies, particularly here in the Valley, which uh, depends heavily uh, in many of the communities that uh, self-help serves. Uh, uh, on the on agriculture to, to for um, for economic purposes and to for a lot of our folks to make a living. So we're, that's a one of the reasons we were very much interested in, in entering into the discussion and wanted to know what these opportunities would be. Uh, restoration of wild habitat, particularly if there's uh, opportunities to to benefit uh, uh, other communities in and around those areas, vulnerable communities, um, uh, and um, even possible local economy. And also reducing um, uh, impacts on, on on the lives of, of folks and increasing uh, the availability of water for some of these folks that are already in overdrawn uh, recharge area areas. And we're really wanting to be very inclusive of all stakeholders, but particularly stakeholders that have been underrepresented in, in the past. You know, uh, vulnerable communities, uh, uh, disadvantaged communities, underrepresented youth, uh, etc. So that's uh, one of the. Uh, uh, one of the things, one of the, some of the goals that we're, we're hoping this program will accomplish. So what does this uh, program look like? Well, there's going to be block grants of up to $10 million. Uh, there's going to be funding for tribes. Uh, the establishment of state support entity, uh, which uh, EDF and uh, uh, Self-Help Enterprises co-chair. Co co and uh, it's going to require uh, an inclusive approach. And uh, that was very evident at our kickoff meeting where we had invited all the Grantees grantees and uh, uh, from across the state, and uh, uh, there's a whole lot of excitement. But there was also uh, a, a very diverse set of groups that are getting together from the ag community, from districts, from uh, a, a environmental interests, from academia, from uh, NGOs, and, and from and from the community directly from the communities. And this is something that um, uh, rarely happens in, in any effort. And this is why. Uh, we're particularly excited uh, uh, that uh, this process is evolving uh, in a very inclusive way, and we want to con contribute uh, uh, in, in, you know, increasing that, in that inclusivity uh, and, and engagement, and, and, and that's going to be uh, one of the top priorities for this effort. Obviously, we want to uh, uh, develop projects that are multi-beneficial, uh, and we want to make sure that we're providing educational uh, and planning and uh, project development and community support. Uh, the uh, minimum uh, benefit of these projects would have would be ten years, but obviously we're looking for projects that have a, a permanent uh, uh, benefit uh, associated with them. Um, at least at this time. So, what does the structure look like? The uh, the uh, multi-benefit land repurposing structure um, well, is funded through um, the DLC Department of Conservation. Uh, the regional bond grants are, are awarded, uh, which are. Uh, uh, funding for tribe is awarded, and the state support entity provides coordination among the block grantees, uh, the communications uh, and capacity building, monitoring, uh, and um, th those are some deliverables that will, will fall under the state support entity. Um, and the idea is to come up with these plans at the community block grant level through a process of inclusivity and, and, and process. And my apologies if apparently my my the, the light in the room where I'm actually in to point out, so I'll, I'll try to get that back shortly. So what would be the uh, SSE, the state support entity's role? Well, we're going to provide coordination, collaboration amongst the block grantees. Uh, we're developing a peer learning network. Uh, a, uh, we feel that uh, folks, as they're implementing and, and uh, advancing these, these, these programs and these great wonderful opportunities, that they will be um, 
you know, at the cutting edge. I mean, they will be the, the in many ways the experts, and we want them to uh, we want the block guarantee to be able to compare notes uh, in, in a way and be able to collaborate with each other and be able to uh, you know identify uh, best practices and, and coordination. We will be providing education and training, and we will bring in, be bringing in uh, additional con uh, experts, content experts that will provide additional support uh, uh, as sub grantees. Uh, to to the to the effort to on our technical assistance side, uh, obviously there's going to be a very uh, focused inclusion effort to engage disadvantaged communities, tribes, socially disadvantaged groups, farmers, particularly small and medium farmers, in, in the planning and development of these projects. Capacity um, building is going to be a, a, a big part of this. We want this to be a successful effort, and we're uh, we want to make sure that uh, all the resources that are reasonably available for us to provide. Uh, the DOC's uh, funding uh, will be available to the uh, block grantees. Uh, and there's going to be obviously uh, monitoring and outcome reporting uh, as part of these, uh, these efforts. This is a, a diagram of what that structure would look like. As you can see, it's uh, flexible. Uh, uh, it looks like, a little bit like an octopus, but a uh, um, state support entity uh, working directly with DOC. We'll have an advisory committee that would, uh, would provide us um, um, additional direction with the DOC. Uh, we will have implementation partners, which could be content experts, to, that will provide more technical assistance uh, uh, as needed and as we identify that to the regional block grantees. And we will be providing direct support also to, to the block grantees as we move forward to, to, through this uh, three year project. So, in summary, uh, it's getting hotter, it's getting drier, climate change is real. Uh, and uh, we are having to make some pretty tough, tough choices. Uh, uh, without um, strategic intervention, uh, you know, we will be having to make even tougher choices down the road. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for us to identify genuine, inclusive, and uh, uh, grassroots, uh, you know, uh, developed uh, opportunities for uh, multi-benefit land repurposing options. For, for, for much of our, our, our communities, particularly those that are mostly uh, most directly affected, which uh, three of the block grantees were in the valley. Uh, the other block grantee was, was located in, in, on the modern, on central uh, coast on, on Monterey uh, County. And uh, we're, we're, we're hoping to be able to provide uh, genuine opportunities to landowners uh, uh, to uh, create uh, multi benefit projects that will benefit, will have regional benefit to obviously rural communities ecosystems and uh, our, our underground uh, groundwater aquifers. So inclusivity is important, regional coordination with stakeholders, engagement, and obviously buy-in. Uh, these opportunities have to be genuine. They have to be organic. They have to be uh, developed uh, by the stakeholders in a way that, that makes sense and uh, that is uh, ultimately beneficial to the, to the folks involved. And it has to be incentivized, and hopefully this will lead to additional efforts that would uh, keep moving us in this direction, which I hope is toward uh, a path uh, to st for sustainability for our groundwater uh, resources. And uh, that was the that was why that was the the end of the presentation. Uh, we can have questions here, or we can wait uh, have questions after uh, uh, Tammy presents. It really depends on on you as the moderator. Okay, yeah, thanks, Eddie. I think we'll hold questions until after Tammy's also talked. So if you have questions for Eddie and you want to jot them down in your notes while Eddie stands up to remind the room that he's there, <laughs> and we'll turn over to Tammy. So my name is Tammy McVeigh, as you guys heard earlier, and I am the Director of Emergency Services. Um, really, we kind of were established by... Um, the drought back in 2014, um, or the beginning of the drought, actually, as some people want to refer to it. And we had lots of um, residents calling us and counties calling us because they know us as a developer. Um, we're a nationally recognized developer and we build low income housing. So they said, hey, can you do something with these folks that are going dry? Um, at the time, our community development director and another staff member went to Harbor Freight and purchased some tanks and some PVC and created a tank, an emergency tank system, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but we, the goal of self-help is really to work collaboratively with um, our 
our communities. The goal of emergency services is really to work with the folks who have been impacted directly by disaster. So um, all of the emergency services team is trained in disaster response and recovery, as well as um, psychological first aid. So whenever we're dealing with folks who have been impacted by disaster, we have the skills to talk with them um, and find out what their real needs are. So self-help covers all of the San Joaquin Valley um, minus San Joaquin County. The only team right now covering San Joaquin County is our emergency services team. And that is because they really needed some assistance with some of the drought response. So hey, we went ahead. Tammy, I'm just going to jump in here. I think um, if you're advancing the slides, we can't see that. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, I here. see they're coming through now. They're moving very slowly. I. I'm so sorry. I know we're having issues. Okay, they're with... through now. Okay, they're through now we can see this. Okay, go ahead and sorry continue. about that, everyone. Um, so hopefully it stays up to pace with you um, or with us. So we added in the San Joaquin Valley or San Joaquin County, and we've been working there since July. Um, we are not going to expand any further though. So. Let me see. I'm sorry. My slide. Is it moving for you guys now? Because it's not moving on my side. We see the background slide now. Okay. Um, so our background is, you know, we work with low income families to develop um, housing. And then we also come in with our emergency services and water work. Um, one of the things that we noticed is as we saw the water tables continue to decrease and decline, um, we were drilling wells and we were drilling a lot deeper and we were really concerned with what the water quality was going to be for those wells. Um, so through funds from the State Water Board and SAFER, we were able to um, put together a water quality program, which I'll go into in a, in a minute, but some of our other work is um, we engage with folks who have been impacted by drought fire, flood, extreme heat, earthquake, and we also do COVID education. Um, so we have a pretty big area that we work in, um, but our, our main area is water sustainability and water quality. So when folks are impacted by the drought, um, we go out and that's a tank, a picture of a tank right behind um, the, the lady and the gentleman. And that's the tank that we install and we connect it to the home and we have water hauled to that tank weekly or bi-weekly depending on the household size. Um, then we also have associated bottled water that goes along with that. So the tank water is only for um, sanitary purposes and then the bottled water is for drinking and cooking. And in addition to that, we we roll them into the water well program. So we find out if either they're near a connection or near a main so we can connect them or we replace their well where we have to. Sometimes we can repair the wells depending on um, the, the quality of it. So then once we repair the well, we do water quality testing. Um, our funding comes directly from State Water Resource Control Board under the SAFER division. And that is the only funding we currently receive for the work that we're doing. Um, our current workload, and I apologize that this is so light, um, we have reported over 4,100 dry wells to the um, dry well my, my dry well tool, and we are happy to be working side by side with DWR and the Gamma folks on improving that system, um, making it a lot more easier to be able for us and DWR to pull those reports. Right now we have 1500 tanks on the ground servicing over 2000 homes. So what that means is we have community tanks in um, some of our small rural communities. And then we have 800 new well or connection applications that we are working on um, and processing to get new wells drilled. Wells are taking a long time to get drilled. Um, drillers are just backed up and they don't have enough uh, staff. We have installed 183 filtration devices this year and we are currently providing 1700 households with bottled water and we have almost 200 folks enrolled in our private well education course. 
So our water quality is for private well owners. Um, you don't have to have a new well. You can have an older well. We'll go out, we'll do an assessment, and we test for contaminants. And then um, once that analysis comes back, we review it with the family. And if there is any type of um, contamination, then we'll work with the family and our, our local vendors to find out what the best um, filtration devices, be it a POU or a POE. Um, for those of you that don't know, POU is point of use and POE is point of entry. And this is what a day in the life of um, our water quality team looks like. People will call in, they'll say that they're, you know, their well owner, they think something's wrong with their well, they think they have contamination. And so this is just kind of a flow chart of how it moves from one group to the next um, of staff. So we can provide the information to the residents um, with the appropriate associated documents. So if they have contamination, um, these are the constituents that we test for. So arsenic, nitrates, one, two, three, TCP, coliform, lead, perchlorate, EDB, E. coli, copper, DBCP, chromium, uranium, and then along the Sierra Nevadas, we test for gross alphas. Um, again, treatment devices that we use are point of use, um, reverse osmosis, point of entry, GAC filtration, and we're also working with State Water Board on adding PBOS to our um, testing scope. And in 2020, this is just some back data, we did 330 um, permanent solution projects and we were providing water to, 13, seven, to 1,300 households. So um, basic requirements, people always say, how do we become a vendor of you or for you guys? Um, just, you know, you have to have expedited installation, be available to go out and do any types of um, maintenance that needs to be done, and then also offer long-term maintenance plans for the resident because we do want them to be on here while we're also educating them so that way they can be um, self-sufficient and resilient. So, um, Yes, there is a lot of unpredictability. That's another requirement is our vendors need to be prepared for the unpredictability. Some folks don't even have sinks. So when we're trying to install um, point of use devices, we don't have a sink or a cabinet to install it. And we have to find different ways to get them access to clean water and have a filtration device put in. Um, lots of rural areas that we travel to. And again, not all installations are the same. Is it keeping up with you guys still? Because it's really lagging on my side. It is. We're seeing uh, we're seeing your water informing clients about water quality slide. Okay, so this is what we provide to the to the client or to the participant. Um, whenever we get their results back and we go over it with them very thoroughly, we have a water quality specialist who this is his background, and this is all that he does. It's what he's done for the past twenty years. So. Um, He's very thorough when talking with the residents and explaining to them what their best next steps are. So um, some of the obstacles that we have is, of course, you know, the San Joaquin Valley is known for a lot of different contaminants that are um, really kind of around ag. We have done a few different case studies and some of our filtration devices have not actually filtered um, the levels have been so high that we haven't been able to get under the MCL. So we are still working in some of these areas. Um, and then we have some of our concerns for the future and obstacles um, really is funding. Uh, that's always a huge concern because all of the programs that we offer are at no cost to the residents and the residents are all 80% um, or lower MHI. So we are concerned with that. Contamination mitigation, again, that's a huge concern because not a lot of the devices are um, NSF certified and they're not really prepared to filter out some of the um, contamination that we found as high as the levels are. Nitrates, for example, has been really big for us and we have broken down systems within a month and had to replace those systems um, just to try to get clean water to folks. So let's see. Um, 
opportunities. We are, you know, we did continue to expand our service territory. We are putting a stop on that um, just for now until we can wrap our heads around what's going on here in the San Joaquin Valley. And then that is it. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Tammy and Eddie for these presentations. This is really great. Um, and I, there are some questions floating around in chat and I'll try to bring some of those people forward. And of course we can always take hands in the meeting as well. And we have about 25 minutes on the agenda for Q and A, which is just wonderful. Um, so I, um, you know, my, myself and Marisa at Stantec, we, in support of Floodmar, um, we're, and the network, we're helping to re, sort of reawaken some of the discussions that were happening much earlier in Floodmar about how the efforts of trying to increase managed aquifer recharge could be in service to the needs of marginalized and, and disadvantaged communities. And during those uh, conversations at the network over the last couple of months, um, it became really interesting that there are a number of people who are working on the potential for new recharge to be in service of water supply reliability and other people who are working on the concern that new recharge could be a degradation on water quality. And so that, the, that of course, the devil is in the details on these projects about recharge on whether on how to properly manage them such that they are bringing a benefit and not bringing an additional burden. And Eddie, I saw recharge was one of the things that, that land repurposing is thinking about. I'm wondering if you have, um, and I know you were going surface level for your presentation. I'm curious on the recharge space, if you have more depth that's being talked about in the, in the conservation effort. No, 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 not, not at, um, at this point, however, the Pixley uh, Irrigation uh, 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 GSA, um, uh, Pixley uh, uh, GSA, uh, that they're they're one of the community block grantee. Uh, they are looking at one of their projects in the Teveston area uh, that's uh, proposing a recharge project in and around that area, which uh, will be um, at least in concept uh, at this point. Where they're they're considering. Uh, to look at um, the effects of, of recharge on um, improving, possibly improving groundwater quality, as was one of the one of one of the parts of that study. Uh, um, you said has, uh, is involved in those discussions, uh, and they, they would be involved in monitoring of that. Uh, we have a lot of a lot of anecdotal uh, information from some of the areas uh, where recharge has occurred in the proximity of areas that have a water quality issue, where um, there has been an improvement, uh, an anecdotal improvement uh, 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 in, in the, uh, the groundwater quality uh, in those areas. However, uh, it would be um, that's one of the projects, at least in that area, where, where, where they'd be looking at that as an option. Uh, we're pretty excited at, 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 at that possibility once those projects do uh, develop and, and, and are implemented to see what, what, what those results will be. But um, um, I guess on, on that question, that's as, um, as complete an answer I can give you at this point. No, it, it's wonderful. I, I think there's, um, and that's one of the beauties of the Floodmar network is that we discover parallel processes and good context to maintain going forward. I'll, I'll go to a question that's in the chat. Um, Daniel, do you want to um, voice your question? Although I see you may be getting some answers also in the chat. So why don't you repeat your question and, and Tammy can answer and then maybe I'll call on Chelsea to also weigh in. Yeah, I, I was just impressed, Tammy, by the, the number of, of projects you've installed, but then I started to think about the 1 million um, number that we often hear in the DWR, also referenced in the um, chat, and just wondering, you know, what the, you know, how you see the, the capacity to meet those needs and how you're triaging it, I guess, really is the question, and how those folks are surviving that are not receiving support like you're offering is going. I don't think we, we don't hear as much about the, and we, we all hear about the hardship, but really when you start to think about the numbers, it's pretty astounding. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I was trying to type it in chat, but there's so many um, other factors that go into um, that. So through the rest of the state, anywhere inside of our service territory, so here in the San Joaquin Valley, we are the only service provider. Um, so we, we do stay pretty busy, but we have a hefty team that can handle that lift. Um, 
But throughout the rest of the state, what we've been doing is working with the State Water Resource Control Board to provide um, technical assistance to counties and other nonprofits to help capacity building. So that way they can apply for the funding. Um, the management and admin team here goes in and does one on one training with those counties if they decide to apply for the funding. So all the way from the application proposal to the implementation of the program and then we're available for them after the fact. Um, unfortunately, because it does take so many people to be able to pull off the work that we do. A lot of counties have kind of, you know, stayed away from applying for the funds. Um, so we've seen our DWR is coming in with their program, which I think is going to be super helpful as well um, for, for households and counties. But we've seen a lot of folks that are honestly just doing everything they can. So they're running, you know, um, water hoses from their neighbor's well. They've got canal water running into their um, home for bathing. There are lots of families, and it's hard for me to answer some of these questions because it, it's a little emotional for me, but there are lots of families that go um, take their kids to gas stations or um, truck stops for showers. And, you know, they, they do what they can to survive. Um, it is an expensive program and it is definitely not sustainable. Um, just one, just for the, the folks that we're providing the services to now. So if we weren't to provide any more services and not accept another call, it would cost us over $32 million within a year just to do what we're doing for tanks and hauled water only. That's not any of the other programs. So it's a very expensive program to run. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what the rest of the state is doing other than just making it by. Um, we hope to be able to build more capacity through the next few months. So by the time we get into summer, next summer, um, those counties and the residents will have services. Thank you. I, I think it's really important for everyone to hear those hardships and you know to understand it's not just this number that's reported, but what, what that actually looks like. So thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Chelsea, do you want to share about the resource that you put in chat related to Daniel's question? I might have caught Chelsea off guard. That's OK. Chelsea in chat was talking about the State Water Resources Control Board has a portal, and there's a link there um, related to the um, the water systems that have been judged failing or at risk inside the SAFER program. And I saw a question come into chat just in front of a hand go up from Aisha. So let's go to Julian. Julian, do you want to ask your question out loud or should you prefer me to read it? Hi, no, I can. Um, go ahead. Question for those folks, um, DOC dealing with multi benefit land repurposing um, about the SB 170 stipulation in that uh, GSA cannot account for, or, or I'm sorry, I have to go back and read this. Uh, any, any groundwater achieved through these strategies and projects must be subtracted from any calculation by the Groundwater Sustainability Agency from the groundwater available for extraction by water users. Um, can you explain how we can go about doing recharge with this happening and, and still having users pull water out of the ground? So this language was in the first appropriation as well and was added by the legislature um, originally and then it carried over kind of automatically. Um, it's, it's challenging. So kind of first off the program is is um and it's not it's not the only program that's putting funding towards recharge so dwr has quite a bit of money that's dedicated to larger kind of deliberate recharge project implementation um our program can regardless of this language um fund all of the outreach planning and all the way up until shovel readiness of a project to do groundwater recharge um there is a question, and we're going to have to look at this on a project by project basis of whether, you know, a described groundwater recharge project 
like if this causes a problem for implementation. And um, one of the beauties of the program is that we have really, really close partnership with DWR and the um, State Water Board. And, um, you know, I think the, the simple the simple thinking right now is, yeah, it's going to be problematic for a large, like deliberate, like a water bank type recharge scenario where you're, you know, putting rights with water with rights attached in the ground for use later. I think it becomes a little bit more gray area when you're talking about like passive water, you know, flood mark type systems where you're where you're storing water a little more passively and like some of those are flood flows, but I mean I mean all of those have rights attached to. So um ultimately it is it's gonna take some 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 judgment calls from the board and it's going to be done in a collaborative way through the program, but up until implementation, we could fund all of those costs. So I don't think we're in a, a really bad place. If it's just, you know, cap like trying to capture water, more water, you know, on lands from um, water that has no owner, like we're in the clear, you know, it's not. And, and the original intent of this language was, was, you know, we, they didn't want a landowner who got, let's say, money from the state to do habitat on their lands to just sell the water rights out from underneath, like the the saved water from that habitat use versus the irrigated use. They didn't want them to sell that water underneath the property and like leave the state without that groundwater sustainability benefit. And it's kind of it's a shame we haven't been able to move the language more towards like broader sustainability language. But we just haven't. It had didn't get there in this legislative session. So great, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. As as we as we met, most of us have learned there's um, depth of complexity on all sorts of angles related to Floodmar and the policies that are supporting its kinds of projects. And what's great about this network is that you every time you learn a little bit more about something that someone else knows a rich depth about. Right, so I really appreciate the question, Stephen. Thank you, Aisha. Why don't you go ahead? Yes. Hi. Um, this is a question for either or both Tammy and Eddie. Um, just you know, since this is a Floodmar forum, just wondering what you think the promise of particularly recharge is for long-term sustainability of drinking water users. Um, you know, both, you know, you kind of talked about it a little bit before, um, but do, do you think it's useful? Do you think it's something that could help long-term sustainability? Are you focused more on just getting connected to you know, nearby water systems or do you think it just is a case by case basis? Just wondering your, your thoughts on the promise or risk of recharge. I, 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 I can start that question, uh, and Tammy, you can add uh, most of your, your perspective. Uh, you know, I, I started in the community development department, and and, and we, um, I, I do believe the consolidation is probably going to be uh, the answer for a lot of these, um, uh, where where that's an option for, I mean, that would be preferred uh, option, uh, 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 consolidating um, um, these communities or, or, or uh, individuals who are, have the option to consolidate that are, are within reasonable. I think that's the you know, the, the, the best option available. However, um, for um, areas that are overdrafted, if, if there is an opportunity to move water to those areas, I, I do think that recharge can potentially benefit, have regional benefits to, to those areas. And, and uh, you know, obviously, there's there's a whole lot of data that, that needs to you know come together, uh, and um, uh, you know we need to know geology areas. We need to know if there's some contaminants available in those recharge areas. We uh, there, there's a, there's a lot of a lot of things to consider, but but I do feel that there is an opportunity to benefit, particularly uh, areas in and around uh, aquifers that are already overdrafted and, and and communities that may not necessarily have. The opportunity to um, uh, connect to uh, an adjacent uh, viable system, um, so potential there, but it's going to be on a case by case basis. Uh, and Tammy, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, no, I think you you did a great job answering it. You know, as far as we are concerned on the emergency services side, um, our our focus is 
much greater than water and we have been <laughs> we are the doom and gloom I feel like we're you know we're worse than the weather guys because the weather guys always come on before us and then we go on after and we talk about what's actually happening boots on the ground um so we have we have a lot of concerns about the sustainability of the valley just in general um not just around water but water has a huge um part in it and i i'm hopeful so i'll answer it that way i'm hopeful that we will see something amazing happen um but we're also trying to be prepared for what it will look like if we don't get the results that we're hoping for i hope that answers your question thanks tammy and i've been in many meetings with you but i'm afraid i'm gonna not get your name pronounced right Kili. -E? that's really good it's good yeah. to see you yeah, no, that's good, Mike. Okay, um, it's been a while. What's your question? It has been a while. Go ahead. Um, it's more of just a comment, and I gotta, I gotta run after this. But I just wanted to, because this is such a like great network. Um, I just wanted to point out, um, the multi-benefit land repurposing program is really a, a unique and special opportunity to to push forward the the goals and projects of Floodmar because it's really flexible. So. Each of the four block grantees that we awarded funding to have a pot of funding and they can really set their destiny on what kind of projects they want to get ready for funding or they want to implement. So I just really, I'm going to share um, the descriptions of the different grants we have in the chat. And I just really encourage you to, to think about how your goals could be, you know, achieved in these different areas through this program, because it covers everything within the subject area um and then the other powerful piece which i which i mentioned before is that you know this program's really run by a like all of the agencies you'd want looking at your stuff to do this work it's, it's dwr us fish and wildlife dfw all you know, like everybody um the water boards food and ag and and there is a very like committed responsibility to look at these projects and strategies to try to resource other funding to them from their different pots. There's so many pots of funding across all these departments. So um, pay attention to what people are planning, what they're proposing, and then try to use, uh, use this opportunity to leverage, you know, what, what we're all trying to achieve. Um, and then just flag for everybody that there is going to be another round of funding coming out. There was 40 million in this last budget um, for um, and a round that we're probably going to push out at the end of the year and using largely the same guidelines as before. And then there's another 20 million identified in next year's budget that may go, you know, may change through those negotiations, but at least we'll have 20. So more to come. And we, kind of the last thing is we had really, really strong applications that basically covered, you know, 90% of the, the, the San Joaquin Valley, the Salinas Valley and in the nor in Northern Sacramento Valley. So we have some really like high level partners wanting to join the program. And I think you'll start to see more and more projects and partner, you know, block grant partners lining up that can help us all. So that's it. And I'll share my, I'll share the project summaries in the, in the chat. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I was, I was kind of struck as I was watching Eddie on, on your discussion, um, how recharge is kind of one of the outputs, but I, I think recharge projects, that were some of the recharge projects that we're discussing um, actually loop back to some of the other output goals as well about economic sustainability and jobs and, and things like that. Cause all those recharge projects, depending upon which kind it is require, you know, people to take care of them and maintain them and whatnot. So there is some iteration that happens between the various output goals of the multi-benefit project, which is, is nice to, to think about because a floodmar project might not be imagining itself as a workforce development strategy in a way that it could be. Um, so your the program really helps you start to think that way. Um, Kamiar, go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you, Eddie and Tammy, great presentation. Uh, Eddie, you had one of your slides, early slides uh, showed the different types of land repurposing strategies uh, that landowners could consider in uh, thinking about repurposing or converting part of their irrigated lands to other uses that would be uh, either less water intensive and or help groundwater recharge. What strategies or approaches 
do, do you think would help to actually, I mean, each of those options, you need a lot of information um, to get to landowners. What strategies uh, could be available to actually help in getting that information to landowners? And one, one thing the Floodmar Network might want to consider is how we could maybe help in disseminating that kind of information. Well, thank you for that. And I guess the answer, uh, I'll start off with yes, we, 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 want, uh, we want partners. We, we're looking for, for, for experts in the field that have, who have access to this data. And I do see the, uh, uh, there, there, there is a lot of opportunity to, to, to coordinate and collaborate with, with other folks who are already specialized in, 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 uh, in this, in this, uh, this field. Uh, we, um, we will be uh, subcontracting out to other groups, but we will be also reaching out to experts in the field. The, the idea is to make any relevant data uh, that uh, where there's an interest from the, uh, the community block grantees uh, at, uh, available to, the, to those groups, uh, as long as funding is available to, to be able to do that. When these collaborative opportunities have present themselves, particularly when we already have a group that's involved in this particular, in this particular field, obviously that, that, that collaboration becomes a little bit easier to do. Uh, and, uh, and we're, we're, we're going to be very welcoming of, 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 of including uh, of this, this type of resource uh, to, to, to block on for sure. Thank you. So um, one question in the chat, I don't know if there's anybody on the call who could answer it and maybe Graham himself is here. Um, there's a question from John Armstrong about any update from the Paleo Valley groundwater recharge science that Graham Bong's been leading. Is anybody on the call who's associated with that effort? Okay, we will note it as something that is of interest to this group and make sure that that update's available the next time we get together. Are there any other questions for Kimmy? Or you still have your hand up? I think that's probably a figment. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No problem. Are there other questions for Tammy and Eddie? Eddie or Tammy, do you have a question for any of us? I don't have a question, but I do have a request um, sure. of the, you know, next steps or what can we do um, really for for our side of it on the emergency services side is bringing awareness to how severe the the drought is, how real climate change is. You know, we are seeing so many things, um, especially here in the Central Valley that we haven't ever seen before. Like, you know, I grew up in the San Joaquin Valley and I was very used to having fog for three months straight and not being able to see out of my windshield, you know, and now my kids have to go to school in the morning because we don't have fog days. Um, they're super bummed when I tell them about the stories. But, um, you know, at taking that into consideration and being very serious, but also those of you that work in water, if you have friends that work in housing or, um, you know, just your professional contacts, um, having those conversations, very real conversations about the amount of development that it, the state of California needs in order to keep up with housing um, and how quickly it needs to be done. We're not even able to keep up with the infrastructure to get these services to the houses that are already there. So just, you know, considering all of that and just having those conversations, having them at the dinner table, having them with your friends while you're out, maybe having a cocktail, whatever it is, but making sure that that awareness is out about how severe the conditions are, especially here for the San Joaquin Valley, is my one ask that everybody maybe take away from this. Thanks, Tammy. That's a great reminder and an and easy ask to carry out. So I don't think any of us have an excuse. And Eddie, how can the Floodmar Network be of most help to the work that you lead at Self Help Enterprise? You know, um, uh, I was just going to jump on that one because you're asking, and you know, we're really good about asking for help. So, uh, uh, so this is this is this is a general call out. I mean, uh, obviously, data is going to be very important uh, to identify uh, a viable recharge area, uh, particularly data that uh, uh, that provides uh, contaminant information for areas that may be potential recharge candidates. Uh, I think Floodmar is front and center, uh, uh, and that, and I do feel that there's this is there's some strong opportunity for collaboration uh, with, with with this community. And, and this effort and other efforts like uh, like this that are going to involve recharge, particularly in and around areas that are already affected, they're already affected by contaminants. Uh, 
uh, because we want to make sure that uh, you know that we can try to resolve the water availability uh, issue that we're not uh, you know creating another issue for some of the community, uh, particularly the vulnerable communities that are located in these affected areas. Thanks, Eddie. And so Tammy and Eddie both, thank you so very much for your presentations today. Um, it's always great to have these kinds of discussions at Lunchmar and we were glad we were able to get you scheduled today and you had time to give to the group. And I know the group was committed to giving back. So that's part of the, the give get philosophy of the Floodmar network. And thanks everyone for coming. We have another one, I think scheduled for November. Marisa, do you have that date off the top of your head for everyone? It's the first Wednesday. I think that's November 2nd. Okay. So we'll see you at the next lunch bar or we'll see you out there managing water somewhere in the world. I appreciate everybody's time and I uh, hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you.